Okay, so we had this circuit before that has both an R, an L, and a C with a switch that is going to open at time zero. So after time zero, looking at for time infinity, well after time zero, all we have is that five volt source, the capacitor, the resistor, and the inductor together in this circuit. Okay, so we're looking for what is VC, the voltage across the capacitor at time infinity, and what is IL, the current through the inductor at time infinity, based on the sign conventions given here. So, based on this, well after time infinity, we know that that inductor is going to become a short circuit, and this capacitor is an open circuit, so no current is going to flow through the capacitor. There's only one path now, so that means no current flows through the inductor either. So IL at time infinity is zero. I'll erase that so it's a little clearer to write. Hold on. VC at time infinity, since it's an open circuit, I'm going to have no voltage drop across that resistor because there's no current going through it. And that leaves all of my voltage drop to occur across the capacitor. That inductor's still a straight wire and no current's going through it either. So, if all of my voltage drop across the capacitor, that means I have to have the same as my five volts for my voltage source. So VC at time infinity would be five volts. So that completes solving our initial conditions that we need in RLC circuits. Remember, it's a lot more initial conditions than we needed in just the RC or RL circuits. Um, but solving for VC infinity and IL infinity would be the same as we did for those circuits. It's just looking at what it would be at DC well after time zero. Okay, so we're going to get into now a general case um, for a source-free RLC circuit. So this is a source-free RLC circuit. So it's going to look like a resistor an inductor and a capacitor all arranged together in series. We're going to start with the series version at least. Um, but there's no source. There's no voltage source, no current source left for them. And we can then write a general equations for these. I'll warn you, going through the derivations of this is going to be a little tricky. I don't expect you to be able to go through the derivations on your own. It's just basically we're going to get through um, get to the point where we can plug and chug and known equations that we have. So with these capacitor, inductor, and resistor, we want to know what's going to happen with them once they become source free. So they're all in series, they're all going to have the same current I, but I can't assume that that capacitor is just going to be an open circuit. I'm dealing with again things changing in time. So how I'm going to solve for it is write a KBL equation for this whole loop. So first I'm going to start with what's the voltage drop over this resistor right here. Well we know we can write the voltage drop as the resistance times the current. The current that goes through it, since it's in a loop with these guys, has got to be the same as what goes through the inductor and the capacitor. I'm just going to call it right now I. That's the voltage drop across that resistor. Now I'm going to deal with the voltage drop across that inductor. I know based on my equation for a voltage drop over an inductor, D equals L di dt. Again, I can't assume that derivative of current is, now isn't, is not necessarily now zero, since things can change in time. So I'm going to sell, say L di dt here. And then I also have a voltage drop across that, this capacitor here. That's equal to, based on the equations we've known for a voltage drop over capacitor, 1 over C times the integral of I dt. So, plus the integral of I, that I is now as a function of time, dt. And I'm taking that integral um, when it's source free for this negative infinity to time t. Could alternatively be taking it from time zero to positive infinity, but it's the idea of I'm taking an integral with some respect to time. 
When I have this equation, all of these are going to equal to zero based on a KVL loop. The sum of the voltages across all three elements has to equal zero. To solve for this, this looks like a scary equation, and it is. It is a second order differential equation. And how I get to that is I'm going to differentiate each side with respect to time. Okay, and that gets me R di dt plus L di squared dt squared. That really should be d squared i, but you get the idea. It's the second derivative. Plus, now when I differentiate the integral, I just get i, oops, and I should have had my 1 over c here, there, i over c equals 0. This is, ladies and gentlemen, a second order differential equation. And while I do not expect you to be able to come up with solutions for that, we're going to study three general solutions for this second order differential equation because they're all going to be in some form of this when we have a source-free RLC circuit in series. So you don't know, have to know how to do it yourself. We're just going to have to know how to plug and chug once we get to these equations. So first of all, to do that, let's rewrite this here. So I have R di dt plus L d squared i dt squared plus i over c equals zero. Okay, if I were to rearrange this and let i be a general solution, I'm trying to solve for my current i here, since that's what I have as the second order differential of, I have the differential of current i. I know that a general solution to the second order equation is a, some constant, e to the st. Again, I don't expect you to know that. It is true that that's a general form um, for the, a solution to this. So I'm going to let this be my solution. I need to find what a and s are. They are constants, though. And I'm going to... Let s equal the derivative with respect to time. Okay, uh, let's call let's call that s one. This is a different s here in this equation is not the same as that s one up there. Okay, so that gives me if I can let this i be my general solution, then I would really have i onto, rearranged from this, I'm going to have s squared plus r over l. I divided my whole equation by l, so that got rid of my l here. It goes away when I divide by l. I divide that by l. Divide this guy by l. r over l s plus 1 over LC. Okay, and that whole thing is multiplied by I equals 0. That's what I get when I rearrange a little bit and divide by L. My I, as we said, was equal to this general solution in the form of AE to the ST. So I can rewrite this as AE to the ST times S squared plus r over ls, plus 1 over lc. That whole thing has to equal 0. Okay? There is no way for this general solution of a to the e, a times e to the st, cannot equal 0. Just prove to yourself, no matter what you plug in for s, as long as a isn't actually 0, um, there's no way to get that equal to zero. So I'm forced to make this part of my equation equal to zero to make that statement true.
the general form for solving that, this looks like a quadratic. Now that I've kind of gotten rid of the scary differentials, I have something squared plus something to the power of 1 plus a constant, right? The general solution for a quadratic, so these solutions for s here, are equal to, I would have negative r over 2l. That's kind of like taking your negative 1 half b part of that plus or minus the square root of r over 2l squared minus 1 over lc. Make sure you can see that clearly. Okay, this is a general solution for this quadratic equation, assuming s were constant when it's really going to equal this scary differential here. Okay, This has two solutions, one when I have the plus sign and one when I have the minus sign. So I really get an S1 and an S2, two solutions to this equation. These solutions are called roots. You might remember roots as solutions to a quadratic equation. So I have roots S1 and S2. Okay. To help define these, I'm going to make terms. So I'm going to loop, lump together r over 2l as a term, and I'm going to lump together 1 over L, square root of lc. Sorry, that should have been the square root. Oh, nope. Not a square root. Get rid of that. This is l. That's c. Leave it as it is. That's going to be one term. So I'm going to define alpha as my r over 2l term. Alpha is just going to be a constant. But I can calculate alpha if I know r, that's my resistance in my RLC circuit, and if I know l, that's my inductance. Easy peasy to calculate. But I have w0 is my other term I'm going to define, and it is going to be 1 over the square root of l times c. Okay. We'll see then what this plugs into here. So our general equation for the solutions to this scary quadratic, where s1 and 2 equaled negative r over 2l, plus or minus, oops, the square root of r over 2l squared minus 1 over LC. Okay. This means I can plug in my alpha and W naught terms that we just defined and instead write this. My solutions S1, that's not pretty at all. Try that again. S1 and 2 are equal to negative alpha plus or minus the square root of alpha squared minus omega naught squared. Again, alpha here is defined to be r over 2l, and omega naught is defined to be 1 over the square root of l times c. Okay, so this means if these were my solutions, remember I really had my solutions as something that was a e to the st onto s squared plus 2. In this case, I could write it as alpha s, going back to my original equation and plugging in, plus w naught squared. Okay. This really means I'm going to get two solutions just like I had two s's here two solutions for my current i that I was trying to solve for. So i1 here is going to be some constant a1 e to the s1 t, where s1 is when I evaluate this equation using the plus. Okay, I'm also going to have, oops, let's click that, i2 here as a2, some other constant, e to the s2t, where 
S2 is evaluating this equation, but using the minus sign from it. So that's how I get my two solutions from it. There are several cases for how this will plug in to this general equation here, based on what's alpha and what's omega naught. So if alpha is greater than omega naught, and keep in mind we can calculate alpha and omega naught just based on knowing our resistance, our inductance, and our capacitance. So they're just going to be a constant we get to calculate and plug in. If alpha is greater than W naught, then what's going to happen in this RLC circuit is that the current, if I were to graph current as a function of time, is going to go up and then kind of slope back down. This is what's called overdamped, like if you had um, trying to dampening the ringing of a gong or a bell, something like that that's an oscillatory sound. We'll talk about why it's overdamped when we get to the underdamped case. More from it. So this is if my alpha is greater than omega naught from it. Okay, if alpha is greater than omega naught, then what does this really mean in terms of my values? Well, it means that R over 2L, that's alpha, has to be greater than 1 over the square root of LC. If I solve this for the capacitance in terms of my inductance and resistance, that means C it has to be greater than 4 times L over R squared. So my capacitance has to be greater than 4 times my inductance over my resistance squared. If it is, this is the kind of graph that my current will look like, and it's going to be what's called an overdamped response for this RLC circuit. My general solutions to this will look like these. I1, I'll have, always have two solutions, A1 e to the S1t, which I can plug in here, and A2 e to the S2t will be my solution I2. Okay. The second option is what happens if alpha is exactly equal to omega naught. This means my R over 2L is exactly equal to oops, 1 over the square root of L times C. Therefore, solving for my capacitance, C, is equal to 4 times L over R squared. Okay, my capacitance is exactly equal to 4 times my inductance over my resistance squared. In this case, when I plug into my solutions, S1 and 2, I will end up getting negative alpha plus or minus the square root of alpha squared minus W naught squared. That was my general solution. The problem is here, alpha is equal to a W naught. So this whole term goes to zero. When I do that, I don't get two solutions. All I have is then S1 and 2 just equals alpha. I've lost this whole term. So to make my two solutions for this case, my I of t is going to consist of A2, some constant that I'll have to solve for, plus A1 t e to the negative alpha t. Okay, I need this extra term, the A1 times t, so that I get two possible solutions from this based on an A1 and an A2. The graph of this current with respect to time, when alpha is equal to W0, this is what's called critically damped. We're exactly at kind of a tipping point before we're going to get some damping effects that we'll see. The graph really looks about the same as we saw before in the overdamped case for you. It just makes a very specific curve here that this point of time becomes 1 over alpha. And when that point in time is equaled, I get i is equal to e to the negative 1 over alpha. You don't really need to know that. It's just that the graph of the curve is going to look very similar to overdamped but it's a very specific curve now that I can see it can't go higher or lower than that hump.
The really more interesting case, though, is the third option I can have based on my alpha and w naughts that I can ca calculate here. And that is when alpha is less than w naught. So that means alpha was r over 2l, and w naught is 1 over the square root of l times c. Therefore, c is less than 4 times l over r squared. This is what's called the underdant case. And it, if I were to graph current versus time, does some very cool things. Instead of getting this nice kind of upward curve and going down that we were used to in the overdamped or the critically damped case, what I'm going to get is an oscillation. is really what a damping effect sounds like or thinks about. When you think about a gong that you start to dampen, you hit it and it makes the loudest sound first, right? So that's what's happening here, really loud or really large oscillations. And then those oscillations get damped. They become smaller and smaller with time until they echo out. How this curve decreases in time is based on the graph e to the negative t. Remember all of these when we've been doing RL and RC circuits have been e to the negative t over tau graphs. They're going to be very similar here with the RLC graphs. It's just we have these cases of whether we're actually going to get this damping effect or we're only going to get, again, kind of a hump that went up when it was critically damped or over damped. Both of those kind of look similar. It's just their values. Okay. So let's deal with this underdamped case. So when it's true that I have r over 2l is less than 1 over the square root of lc, then my c is less than 4l over r squared. It means my capacitance value is less than 4 times my inductance over my resistance. If my capacitance is really low, it means my inductor is high, and it's probably going to keep a current going, which is why I get a higher current values through this. This is a simple way to kind of think of that. My solutions to this under damp case, S1 and S2, are negative alpha plus or minus. Now, if I were to write negative of W naught squared minus alpha squared, alpha squared, sorry, that would be my general case. W naught squared minus alpha squared is the only way I'm going to get a positive value. If I have negative of that positive in my square root, that means I have a negative in my square root, which means I'm going to get an imaginary number. We're going to call that imaginary number J. So I warned you that um, sometimes in math class, you have I as the imaginary number equal to the square root of negative 1. We do not use I as the square root of negative 1 or the imaginary number in circuits because I stands for current. So instead, we use J as that imaginary number. Therefore, my solutions here, S1 and S2, are going to be imaginary numbers. They're going to be negative alpha plus or minus. Taking that square root of a negative 1 gets me J, my imaginary number. And I'm going to define a term to be w naught minus alpha squared, since it's the kind of flipped of what we've had before. I'm going to call that wd. Don't confuse that with w naught. Square root w naught squared minus alpha squared. Just means that in this case, since w naught's greater than alpha, this is the only way I'm going to get a positive number. So j wd. Those are my two solutions in my underdamped case, where again I get this really cool oscillation pattern that dampens out for my current with time. So current's going to go up and down and up and down, but then eventually go out to nothing. Because it is a source free RLC circuit. Eventually, I don't have a source for that. With this imaginary number, again, imaginary numbers are scary, but we're just going to have to learn to deal with them because they are very useful in circuits. 
it means my general solution is going to take an interesting form. So my general solution for i as a function of t in my underdamped case equals e to the negative alpha t. That looks very similar when we're doing our RLC circuits. e to the negative alpha you can actually use um, to help make that imaginary number j in part with the rest of this. And then I'm going to have a constant a1 cosine of wd t. Remember that wd is just defined to be the square root of w not squared minus alpha squared plus j sine of w dt. This is basically using Euler's formula, um, which you may know from math class, you may not. I really don't expect you to know very well. But it basically that says that an exponential with to an imaginary number, e to the j, of some value theta can be written as actually sine and cosines. It relates sine and cosine equations. Why we get sine and cosines magically show up here. So e to the j theta equals cosine of theta plus j sine of theta. Whereas e to the negative j theta equals cosine theta minus j sine of theta. This is just a way to relate complex number exponentials to sinusoid formulas. And I don't expect you to know that or memorize it, certainly. I give you those on a test. But that is why we magically get these sine and cosines to show up here, basically because we're getting complex numbers in our exponentials. Okay. Um, another way, oops, I didn't write the rest of that equation. So I have e to the negative alpha t times a1 cosine of w dt plus j sine of w dt. This whole thing. I also need to add plus a2. It's a really long solution for i for my current. Cosine of w dt minus j sine of w dt. Phew! Really long equation, but that whole thing continues all the way down here. Another way I can write that is i as a function of t equals e to the negative alpha t. That alpha, again, could be calculated just by knowing my r, l, and c values. And instead of calling these a1 and a2, we can write a new constant, which we call beta1. And we have cosine the w dt plus j sine the w dt. Now that I have this written out like that, I can write it as cosine w dt plus b2 sine of w d. All this did was really combine that I had cosine of w dt twice, so I made my b1 be a1 plus a2, and b2 here is really a1 minus a2 from it. But I will have to solve for these constants b1 and b2. Okay, so this seems like a whole bunch of hogwash. I realize, again, it's the com most complicated thing we're going to do in circuits this semester. But let's do an example of how we'd actually solve this in an RLC circuit. So if I have R, L, and C in series together, that means they all have the same I, so that's what I'm solving for in this equation. All of those were second order differential equation for I, for my current. And let's give these some values. R is 100 ohms. L is going to be 0.1 Henry's and C is going to be 2 millifarads. First of all, I know, want to know what type of response will this have? 
And I can find that out just by calculating my alpha and my w naught terms. So alpha is r over 2L. That's going to equal 100 ohms over 2 times 0 0.1. It's important, again, when you plug these in, all in base units. I have ohms, henrys, but when I do this millifarads here, I'm going to have to be careful. So alpha ends up equaling 500 for me. W naught here is 1 over the square root of L times C. Make sure both of those are under your square root sign. And that, if I do milla, remember, is 10 to the negative third. That gets me 70.7. .7. So, which is larger, or are they equal to each other? In this case, my alpha is greater than my w naught. I have 500 is greater than 70.7. .7. So, what type of response? If alpha is greater than w naught, that means you have an overdamped response. Again, means your i as a function of t will go up and then kind of slope back down. No oscillations or ringing patterns for it. My solutions to this, I will always have two solutions possible for this current, will be negative alpha plus or minus the square root of alpha squared uh, minus w naught squared. So S1 and 2 will equal negative 500 plus or minus the square root of 500 squared minus 70.7 .7 squared. That gets me S1 equal to, when I do the plus sign for that, negative 5.05. .05, and S2 gets me negative 994.97. I'll notice both of these here are negative. I will have negative values when I have an overdamped response. S1 and 2 will be negative. If over damped. Okay, so don't be scared of that. Means my general solutions for I, for my current, will be A1, E to the S1T. S1 was negative 5.05 T, plus A2, E to the S2T, negative 994. 0.97 t. Okay, all I would need to do now is solve for these a1s and a2s, these constants. That will sound like a lot, but all it's going to really require are finding our initial conditions like we did um, when we first practiced our RLC circuits. So I need to know my current through the inductor at time zero. I then get to plug this, that into this equation and hopefully it gives me one constant. Um, I could also need to know then my derivative of current at time zero with respect to time. Plug that into the derivative of this equation and that will get me my second constant, A2. And we will practice that next week. For that, we will also need to know our other initial conditions, the voltage across the capacitor at time zero, the voltage across the capacitor possibly at time infinity, and the current across the inductor at time infinity, and the derivative of voltage across the capacitor at time zero with respect to time. All of these could possibly be need to know to solve RLC circuits. We'll do an example of that in class on Monday. I know this stuff is complicated right now, but all you'll end up needing are your general solutions based on what case it is, overdamped, underdamped, or critically damped, then you get to plug in those solutions, like we plugged in S1 and S2 here, and solve for some other constants based on our initial conditions. Hope you guys have a great weekend. Thanks for watching.